This is an earnings and price correlated fast graphs on Walgreens Boots Alliance. Why would anyone want to own this stock that has been dropping in value since 2015? Tune into this video and find out why. Hello everybody, this is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of Fast Graphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. And I've got kind of an interesting video, at least from my point of view. You know, what I've been telling my subscribers to this channel is that what I'm going to be talking about in forthcoming videos is, you know, really principles of investing, principles of value investing, to be precise. Most of you might know me as Mr. Valuation. That's a moniker that I carry very proudly because I've always written about valuation when I was writing articles on websites like Guru Focus and Seeking Alpha. And now that I've been developing our YouTube channel here, I've been, you know, producing videos quite extensively, always talking about valuation. Like I like to say, measuring performance without simultaneously measuring valuation is a job half done. But no matter what I say and no matter what I try to, you know, illustrate and give evidence to and prove to people, people will always respond to stock price movements as, as you know, the Walgreens Boots Alliance example I did in this video. So what I'm going to do here is I want to start out by talking about some comments that I've been receiving from one commenter in particular, Atma Victu. I don't know if that's a male or a female. I've got just two examples here of comments. You know, one comment he said, it was quite a while ago, he said, sell Apple and buy American Telephone, Verizon, Intel, Walgreens Boots Alliance, and IBM. Said that must have worked out real well for you. Now, the question is, this gentleman or lady, whichever the case may be, simply can't wrap their head around the idea of what value investing is all about. For one thing, it is a long-term investment. And even two to three years is far too short a period of time, as I'm going to build a case for throughout this video, to be judging value investing principles. Now, the second thing that I want to point out and I want to really focus on here is investors have to learn and you know understand what they are actually investing for. Why are they investing in a certain stock and why would they? For example, I want to make a point about this. Why would anyone ever buy a bond? A bond is fixed income. It's, you know, it's going to be issued, let's say, typically in $1,000 increments. You invest $1,000, say it's a five-year bond. In five years, you're going to get your $1,000 back, absolutely zero price appreciation. And then if you have you know, inflation running like we have now, that money could actually be devaluing itself. Your principal could be devaluing at 5 or 6% a year. In other words, there's no hedge for inflation. But why do people buy bonds? Why would people buy a bond in the first place? Well, one thing is they buy a bond because they perceive it to be safe. Another reason they buy a bond is for the income. Now, that reason hasn't really held much credence, at least in my way of thinking in recent times, because interest rates have been so low. But now we find ourselves in a rising interest rate environment, and bonds again might once again become popular investments. But anyway, Atma Victu also went on a, a couple of weeks ago, another comment the in, individual made, says, you think indexes will hit new lows. Never said that, don't know that, don't have no opinion on that whatsoever, Atma. It seems to me you are bottom fishing right now. No, value investing is always attempting to buy bargains. It's attempting to buy when stocks are low. The primary, you know, first rule of investing is, in all types of investing is buy low and sell high. So I'm attempting to buy low. That doesn't say I'm attempting to buy the lowest, and I'm not attempting to find the bottom. I'm attempting to buy when prudence dictates that the investment makes sense. And I'll do more on that here in a little bit later. And then one as a kind of a friend of mine, I guess, uh, at least has been pretty friendly to me in the comment section, MoMA, really responded also to my Intel, said, you know, I've been telling you for two years that Intel is a mess. Not sure you why you like it so much. Anyway, he thinks I'm relaxed and I'm enjoying the hot summers, golfing and eating all day long. You know, just for your, for your edification, Mom, I've lost 40 pounds in the last six months on purpose, I might add. So I don't know how well I've been actually eating. But anyway, I want to kind of respond to these comments because what the real theme of this really this video is about is, you know, why would people invest in certain times of stocks over other stocks? Why would you buy, um, for example, Walgreens Boots Alliance that I've got up here on the screen right now? in lieu of Apple, okay? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One reason is this stock yields 4.85%. It has a high yielding dividend. Now, let's say you're an investor who's living off of their portfolio, who has just enough money 
that they retired with so that that if they invest it, they need to earn, let's say, a minimum of 3 or 4%. Well, you wouldn't buy Apple with a less than a 1% dividend yield, even though Apple's a great company and a great stock and has produced great performance because the risk would be too great. You would, the only way you could use Apple in your portfolio, if it represented your total portfolio, is you'd have to be selling off pieces of it from time to time, kind of eating into your principal, if you will. So the idea is how could that individual build a portfolio where it generated enough income for them to live off and then also gave them an inflation hedge? Contrary, in contrast to bonds, they have the possibility of getting capital appreciation over time. But over time means in the long run, three to five years, I always say, is a minimum because it takes that much time for companies to raise their earnings and to grow their earnings. Even if they're growing it, you know, if they're growing it at 5%, it takes 20 years for a company to double its earnings. At 7%, it takes 10 years to double their earnings. At 20%, it takes 3.6 years to double earnings. So the bottom line is what I'm getting at is here is that, that you know, ultimately I'm a proponent of the belief that you know, you you know, investors in companies and businesses, you know, long term investors in in good quality operating business are ultimately going to get their value from the uh, operating results the business generates. And the key then is to buy them at a good value. So why would you invest in Walgreens? Well, number one is Walgreens Boots Alliance is the dividend champion with 47 consecutive years of raising the dividend. Every year, this company's raised a dividend. So let, let's just look at this stock right now and just think about what the attributes are. First of all, you know, coming out of the recession of 2001, you can still see remnants of it here in this graph. The stock was extremely highly valued. It had good, consistent earnings growth. I'll give you that. Came into the Great Recession, I call it, and it had, you know, some weak numbers and the stock fell. But look at this extended period of time where the stock was overvalued and investors would have made no money. You know, this was like the lost decade. You could have held this stock for all these years. I've gone on this graph here, you know, from September of 2001 through July of 2012, say 10 or 11 years, and actually ended up with a negative one-tenth of 1% annualized rate of return. The reason you would buy a Walgreens Boots Alliance today is because if you're looking for income, it yields 4.85%, and it's raised this dividend every year. When you're looking at the one consistent thing on this graph, it's the dividend income line. The dividend income has gone up year after year after year. And the dividend growth rate has averaged about 14 or 13 or 14 percent per year. Now, more recently, it's been weak. You know, the dividend growth rates have only been a couple of percentage points. That's not unusual when a company's going through some flat earnings growth here. But the company's got a lot of initiatives, including things like owning, you know, almost 30 percent of Amerisource Bergen and others to where they're getting into their health benefit which is expected to give the company a lot of growth potential. You know, that's essentially what could possibly be a catalyst to see this company grow again. I'm going to give you a copy here of Zach's, or I'm going to bring you into Zach's, and Zach's talked about long-term growth model looks encouraging. Not the short run. Zach's, like everybody else, thinks they're going to have some weak numbers in the short run. But earlier, the company noted that beyond fiscal 2024, the company's long-term growth algorithm leads to adjusted EPS growth of 11 to 13 percent as the faster-growing and higher-margin Walgreens health achieves scale. So the point is, if I'm looking at the forecasting graph for Walgreens, and I make adjustments, and I've also put adjustments in here from other firms, like I went to Seeking Alpha, who uses Standard & Poor's, and I put in their numbers here. And that's what I'm looking at here now. We're looking at negative 7 to 8% growth for 2023, fiscal 2023, which ends again in August of 2023. And then we're looking for modest growth in 2024, modest growth in 2025, double-digit growth in 2026, and then 11% growth in 2027. So the key is we're also expecting dividend increases along that period of time. So the bottom line would be if you bought this stock now and we're going to be holding it for one, two, three, four, five years or longer, if the stock traded at its normal PE of around recent normal PE, the last five years, at 10.5 to 11 times earnings, well, then what you would have here is an opportunity to own a stock that would give you a very attractive rate of return 
going out to 2027. If you were, you know, see it trading at around 15 PE, which I believe this stock would be, you know, worthy of, you'd look at almost 23% a year annualized, you know, and 10 PE ratio would give you 15.74. So the key is if you're willing to be patient and be a long-term investor, then Walgreens Boots Alliance looks attractive. The, clearly the best time to buy a stock like this when it's cheap. So what do I like about Walgreens? I like the fact that it's had 47 consecutive years of raising the dividends, a very consistent dividend record. When I look at this company and I look at it through what I consider to be the important metrics, I see that operating cash flow covers their dividend. I also see that free cash flow has covered their dividend, and, and it's expected to begin growing again, by the way. So I really feel like this company's dividend is well covered, and that's what I'm investing in it for. Why am I investing in Walgreen Boots Alliance? I'm investing in it for the dividend, for the income, for the 4.85% dividend yield that's growing every year. And if I'm holding, willing to hold this for three to five years or more, I've got a real good chance of getting a significant amount of capital appreciation in the long run, not necessarily in the short run. I don't know what the top or the bottom is going to be. Now, the same would be Intel, as MoMA, my, you know, one of the commenters that goes by MoMA said, you know, Intel's in a secular decline. Well, let's look at Intel. And now if I go in and look at their performance record, they've grown that dividend by, you know, 15 to 18 percent a year. Average growth has been 17.8. Compound growth rate has been 15.3. Now, once again, the last three years, they've had lower growth, but that's not uncommon. That's happened to them in years past before they had, you know, if they generated the cash flow. So this is a quasi-cyclical company. It always has been. It's a major semiconductor manufacturer, $148 billion in market cap. The stock price is extremely low. They're having a horrible year. But if you're looking at it longer term, this would be the time to be buying, you know, a company like Intel. Once again, I'm buying it for the 4% dividend yield that's been increasing every year. That's the primary reason. And I'm willing to own this stock for a long period of time. Operating cash flow strongly covers the dividend, meaning this orange line on the graph, which is operating cash flow, is significantly higher than dividend. The dividend is only being paid out around 19 or 20 percent of cash flow is being paid out in dividend. That's a very low payout ratio, in my opinion. Free cash flow is a little bit different matter. They usually had free cash flow covering, but they've gone through that. So this is a red flag. The company is not expected to have, you know, good cash flow growth for the next year or so, but then they are expected to, you know, to grow beyond that. But the company does have very modest debt. It's an A-plus balance sheet, and the company does have cash on their balance sheet. So that's something, you know, that we would look into and go deeper as we were researching the stock. So why invest in Intel? For the 4% dividend growth that has grown every year, and it's an A-plus rated, extremely high quality company, probably not going to go out of business. The same is true of IBM. These are income vehicles. I'm not investing in these because I expect them to be slow growers. But what I'm looking at is a 5.05% dividend yield, and the dividend at IBM has grown for IBM's dividend has grown for 27 consecutive years. It's a dividend champion. Intel has only grown the dividend for eight consecutive years. But in the years where they did not, so I want to go back to Intel for you. When the years when Intel did not grow the dividend, they just froze it. The last time they froze the dividend was 2014. They kept it at 90 cents. They also froze the dividend earlier in earlier years, a time or two. So it still has a very good long-term dividend record of almost 9 or 10% a year dividend growth. IBM, 27 consecutive years of dividend growth. The stock is going through a transition. It's beginning to grow again. Once again, when I look at it from these other very important metrics, cash flow has been holding steady, not necessarily growing a whole bunch, but it is covering the dividend dramatically. Free cash flow has been covering the dividend even when it got a little bit weak in 2021, and now it's expected to recover. Their cash flow still covered their dividend. So I'm buying this for the 5.05% dividend yield that's increasing every year. Now, that's not for everybody. If someone's looking to make money or they're a, a shorter-term oriented investor that wants to make as much money as they can, they may not have the patience or the inclination to invest in stocks like IBM 
or Walgreens Boots Alliance at these prices because these stocks are not necessarily going up dramatically. Now, last but not least, I'm going to talk about AT&T. Now, AT&T was yielding almost 8% when I first bought it. They did theoretically cut their dividend, but what they really did was they spun off Time Warner into Discovery, you know, and investors got that. They got compensated for the dividend cut, but now the stock's yielding 5.91%. And prior to that, it's had a very good long-term dividend record, but it still gives me a 5.91% yield. And analysts are expecting the now unencumbered by, you know, their Time Warner media businesses. They expect them to give us, you know, good long-term growth going forward. Companies like Morningstar and Zacks are acknowledging the fact that the company is strong, so it's for the 5.91% dividend. Now, this company does not have some of the characteristics I like. You know, it does have operating cash flow that covers the dividend dramatically. It does have free cash flow that covers the dividend dramatically. And I do expect the dividend here to begin growing again. And even though it cut the dividend, it still has a high dividend yield. I've had this in clients who are looking for income. And AT&T was something that yielded, you know, again, at the time I was investing at 8 or 9%. The stock is languishing, but I believe longer term, the stock promises to generate some very strong rates of return if you're willing to hold it for the three to five year period that I'm talking about here. I don't expect this to be a great short term investment. It hasn't been. And that's admittedly true. But I'm not investing for the short term. That's the key. I'm investing for the long run. And I am not looking at this for people who are looking to accumulate money or make as much money as they possibly can. People always say these stocks are doing poorly. They're talking about the price action, the recent price action. I'm looking at the fundamentals. What does the company have going for it? How you know strong is their balance sheet? How strong is their financial statement? Are they generating the cash flows to support the income? If the companies are doing that, then I'm willing to stay for the long run. But the point is, I bought them for the long run, and I bought them for a specific purpose, for the income, for those people that couldn't afford to take the risk of having to harvest principal in order to meet their income needs. They needed their portfolio to throw off the cash without them having to do anything. And that, to me, is a good strategy if you have to be in that strategy. If you have all the money you need, you don't need the income, then by all means, look for the growthier stocks. Typically, the higher yielding stocks are not the fastest growing companies. The growth comes from the stocks that are still you know, maintaining low payout ratios and low dividend yields because they're using their capital to reinvest in their business. Some of these bigger, slower growing behemoths that have high dividend yields aren't necessarily reinvesting that much in their company. So therefore, they're paying out pretty good percentages of their income to their shareholders, thereby giving their shareholders a high yield. Different strokes for different folks. You invest according to your objectives, to your needs, and your risk tolerances. And one thing I might add when I talk about these companies, you know, IBM is an A- minus rated company, Intel is an A-plus rated and AT&T and Walgreens are both investment-grade, triple-B rated companies. And really, the debt levels of these companies, I think, with the exception of IBM, which is going through a transition, are all reasonable. In fact, Intel has very low debt relative to the amount of cash flow it generates. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, trying to give you some principles of value investing. The key is you buy when they're low, you invest for the long term, and you invest with the attitude of collecting the income if you're looking for these higher yielding investments. And in the long run, you should do better than buying fixed income if the companies do grow and then the price eventually recovers and moves back into some reasonable valuation. The advantage of all these stocks is I believe they're extremely cheap. I think they're very inexpensive, which I think mitigates the risk in the long run. But, you know, it requires the patience to hold on to these stocks, to collect the income for a long period of time, get that dividend raise every year if possible, if appropriate. But, of course, as always, you've got to do your continuous research and due diligence. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a like, ring the bell, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and also take a look at FastGraphs. What a powerful tool to help investors make good, sound, long-term, prudent investment decisions. Thanks for watching.